I think my first year at Princeton, I was certain I was going to be a statistic. I was going to be one of those attrition statistics at the end of the year. And I was never quite sure if I was doing okay or not. And so many of my classmates seemed profoundly confident about how they were doing. They were starting the problem sets the day before they were due. I'd been working on them all week. So I was just really convinced my first year at Princeton that I, that I was going to um, not make it. And I think it, what what helped me there was was actually getting a circle of other female friends who were also engineering students who were also feeling the same way. And I figured we can't all be doing horribly. Some of us must be actually doing okay. And I think I think it's it's very easy to you know it's imposter syndrome. Of course, it's a common thing, but I think it's very easy for it to persist for a long time when you don't get a lot of direct feedback on on how you're doing. And you're, and you're judging yourself based on the confidence of your peers. The 20th anniversary of co-education at Princeton was taking place our junior year. And we got very interested in trying to collect the stories of some of the early uh, early women engineering students. So we interviewed the women from the first three or four C's classes and eventually published a book together on uh, the stories we collected and, and studies we did about women in engineering at Princeton. And so I think for me, uh, the, the lesson in all this is, uh, is the importance of having community and and when it's not there to, to go find it. I actually started back in high school where um, I had just transferred to an American school um, and um, I decided to enter an ID program, ID chemistry course. And, and the chemistry teacher refused to let me in because I was coming from a Chinese school. And, she, and he basically said, you know, you're, you're not qualified. And I was willing to work my my butt off. Um, I uh, was doing all the problem sets, but you know, he just kept on saying, oh, you're not qualified. You're not qualified. Um, it took my dad stepping in to say, look, it's okay if she fails, let her try. And, and so that sort of was a pivotal moment for me. And, and there are several of these uh, that happened along the way. I mean, another one would be in grad school, I think. So um, chemical engineering does not have any more general exams uh, these days, but um, when I was a grad student, there were general exams and they were long, they, they were day long and they were, they were on three subjects and you had to take them, um, uh, their written exams on basically undergraduate um, uh, fundamental chemical engineering materials. And, and I remember studying really, really hard for them and still not doing so well. And I, I was thinking, well, if I fail this, then it's probably not meant to be. Uh, I passed and, and really it took finding mentors who understand where you're coming from um, and who can help you along the way and can prop you up. I wasn't the best student in the room at any point in my undergraduate or my graduate classes. Uh, I had another set of skills uh, that I think I brought a creativity, a breadth of uh, vision that actually came from my breadth of experiences uh, that, that wasn't measured according to the metrics of success of getting an A in classes. The challenge at the time was to have confidence in myself that even if I wasn't achieving, you know, excellence according to the metrics that I was being held up by, that I had something special that uh, would lead to uh, me being successful. Having that confidence, uh, but also communities and mentors of people to, to, to say, you know, you are uh, someone who can make a big contribution to this profession, don't give up, was really important. Uh, I think the other thing that I found challenging throughout my professional journey is that these challenges of implicit bias and of, of you know, this sense that, that women don't belong in this profession or aren't as successful as men continues at every career stage, which is disappointing, right? You think you overcome it as an undergrad and you get your degree and then you go work and, 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 and you've left that behind you, but you haven't. And even as an assistant professor and an associate professor and a full professor, when people would tell me or I would hear, you know, feedback that you're not ready for this or uh, you need to wait wait a few more years to get this honor or whatever, my mentors and supporters said, no, you don't. You are you deserve this now and we're going to put you up for it. And it was mostly men because there weren't a lot of senior women uh, to serve that mentor and supporting role. Diversity is rich. It goes beyond gender. And so obviously uh, th there's many elements of diversity. But the question in particular is tips for men. Perhaps another way to put it is how can they contribute to creating a diverse environment and an inclusive environment where everyone can thrive? And that's my goal as C's Dean. So maybe Lynn, I'll have you start off on that. I think my answer is sure, to lean in. If I think back to all my mentors, uh, the, like you, the majority of them are men. And so they are willing to sort of be open-minded and give us a chance. 
it's always wonderful when when men volunteer for diversity committees or diversity leadership roles, or they're the person to to call out something that's not right that's going on. There's a certain fatigue that comes from having to always be that person. And I'm sure my other panelists are nodding, so I'm sure they, they've been that person more times than they care to care to acknowledge. So it's just that level of support of someone else taking uh, taking the the ownership of that uh, is great. The majority often have the power to bring about effective change, and so. It really is um, beneficial when you have everybody stepping up to say, how do we create a more diverse environment? How do we uh, alleviate the issues that have plagued us and prevented us from having you know, more diverse faculty, more diverse graduate students? What are those issues? How do we get around them? How do we deal with implicit bias, which is a real thing? I, did, you know, I didn't even believe it was real until um, I actually had to write a document on it for the IEEE Awards Committee because there were no women getting nominated for IEEE Awards. And, and you read about it, it is real and it's measurable. And so how, how do you address that? How do you um, I think most people want to do the right thing, but this this is diversity and inclusion is a marathon, not a sprint. And we need the uh, majority to, to help uh, bring about positive change. I mean, I love the fact that our jobs are so flexible. I mean, of course, our, our jobs are demanding, but the flexibility to shift one's hours around. You know, I tend to work after nine o'clock. My daughter goes to bed at 830. You know, so that provides that kind of flexibility, I think, is really great. I also love the fact that in collaborative projects, you know, you can be the heavy lifter for part of the time and, and your, your collaborator can be in other parts of the time. And that happens naturally because one person's expertise is more important at a different stage in the project than another. But it can also help in filling the valleys and, and uh, troughs when when you are more or less busy. So I just, in general, appreciate the, the degree of flexibility. I also try really hard in my research group to make sure that my students have mentors besides me. A co-advisor is the most obvious case, but I try to help them become um, more self-sufficient and, and more savvy about the research field they're in as early as I can, whether it's meeting with visitors or going to conferences early, because I think the more the more autonomous they are, I can still be a, a hopefully a help to them, but they're not as gated on my minute to minute uh, availability as they would be, uh, would be otherwise. The other thing we often hear when it comes to parenting and work or work-life balance is you can have it all. And I would add the caveat that you can have it all, just probably not at the same time. <laughs> you have to prioritize one versus the other. And, and I mean, Jen's alluded to that with, with her examples. And, and I would say the same, I think. So I'm, I'm in Singapore. I've decided to stay in Singapore right now because it's simply better for my son here right now. Um, he's seven uh, and school's open here. Uh, there's in-person learning. And, and I thought that was important. So I'm working remotely. Hence, I'm talking to you at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are choices we make, and and I think um, you need to juggle constantly uh, the choices and the decisions you make. You can have it all, just not at the same time. One of the things that was important for me was to say, um, having a family is important to me. I know that means that I may be sacrificing professional elements. I may not get tenure, but that's okay because it's uh, more important to me to be a mom. And uh, and if I don't get tenure, there's other careers, you know, there's other ways that I can be successful. I don't have to be a, a faculty member. I don't have to win this award or, you know, have so, some particular Google Scholar Index. Um, and so I think part of it is just deciding that success is multidimensional and therefore being successful as a parent and as a friend and as a spouse and as a daughter and as a professor uh, are all important to me in figuring out, okay, how do I prioritize everything I need to do in a day, given that these things are all important and have different importance at different times. Really, to me, if you think about success as, as having a work-life balance, making sure that you're doing things in life other than just working uh, is really an important part of happiness and success and, and, and a full life. say two things. I mean, I think um, find yourself another mentor um, and uh, uh, or find yourself other mentors, I would say, uh, who are willing to support you. Um, I think um, um, especially as a PhD student, we have committees. Um, and so there are faculty members beyond your advisor who know your work intimately. And if they don't, then make it a point 
to inform them your work, right? Um, so when I was a grad student, I every paper I published, I would send it to my committee members and I would say, okay, this is a synopsis of what I've done. And, and this is why this paper is, is important. And just to keep them posted because everybody's busy and out of sight is out of mind, right? So find yourself other mentors who, um, who can effectively advocate for you uh, would be important. And then I would say, I think speak to your advisor um, because the, these hidden biases, um, he, he or she may or may not know about them. And so sometimes it's just bringing awareness. It need not be confrontational, I think. Especially I find that, you know, if you mention this when it happens, um, that's most effective uh, in, in delivering the point, right? So if you wait two days before you then go to him or her and say, well, you remember this day and so on, and this and this happened and and I think that's less effective. If you are able to, to call out the example right there and then, I think it sticks better. There's another factor here that, that it, whether you ask your advisor to nominate you for things. Some students or former students are really proactive in reaching out to their advisor to ask, you know, do you think I'm ready to be nominated for this? Uh, can you nominate me for that? And other students are actually fairly passive about that. And that a, a proactive and good advisor will, will, will be fair and proactive on your behalf. But a lot of people are busy and overwhelmed and are, are reactive to the people that are actually pulling on them to, to do something. So that doesn't mean to excuse the fact that there may be hidden bias there, but I think being as proactive as you can uh, is really valuable as well. And finally, I think to the extent that hidden bias and implicit bias are an important topic, when one can organize events in one's department or even one's research group meetings and say, hey, you know, this, this could be a topic for us to discuss at a research group meeting. Um, as, as part of professional development. I think it's really good if research group meetings or department discussions include not only technical topics, but professional topics as well. And this seems like one that's ripe for department discussion or group research group discussion. I think most people don't think they have implicit bias. And by the way, it's something that both men and women have. That's well documented. Yeah. And they would want to address it if they were aware that they had it. And, you know, there's a few dinosaurs, you know, uh, think that things were better in the 50s, you know, but I think that's very unusual. And so I think most people are open to having that conversation. We do have scientific studies that say having a diversity of perspectives around the table uh, lead to better outcomes. It, you know, in corporate boards, it leads to better outcomes. In, in, in leadership positions, it leads to better outcomes in any organization. And so I think a lot of that is just having the richness of experiences and perspectives. And, and women bring a different experience and perspective, particularly in engineering, where, where we're such a minority. Clearly, it's a pipeline problem, and the, the leakiest parts of the pipeline are, are pretty early, you know, certainly junior high school, maybe earlier. And I think it's, it's a very hard place for us to reach people at scale. Uh, there, there's, you know, sort of the biases that, that teachers themselves bring into the classroom in, in K-6. There's the, the, the sort of social environment of being a preteen or a teenager. So one, I mean, one idea there, I, I mean, we've talked a lot today about mentoring and I, I, it's obviously critically important, but it's very difficult for those of us that are passionate about these pipeline issues to be mentors to seventh graders. Or if we are, it's at our own kid's school. It's not at scale. And I can't help but think that there's sort of an opportunity for vertical mentoring where the mentor who would most inspire a 12 or 13 year old girl is not not me. I don't think they'd have chemistry with me, but maybe they would with one of our first year women students or a high school student. And I think I think we we tend to think of mentors as people that are somehow on the other side of something. I'm not sure what none of us are on the other side of anything, but we should really be encouraging women to see themselves as role models much earlier than they than they might realize they are. And I think that that's not a, a complete solution, but I think the more we can help, you know, these sort of seventh, eighth and ninth grade girls see see their future in people a few years older than them, that would be great. My friend, Sarah Jane Leslie, who um, is now the Dean of grad school, um, had an important study that showed that, you know, these gender biases actually set in much, much earlier, five, six years old, right? Um, and a lot of it could be, could be um, um, unintentional from the teacher's perspective. And so I think, um, yes, we can't be uh, direct mentors to, to six, seven-year-olds, but being able to make these teachers aware um, would, be, would be important. We really need to inspire more girls to become engineers. And I think part of that entails the storytelling around engineering. I mean, if you look at the stereotypes around engineers, they're, you know, certainly from our generation, they carried pocket, pocket 
protectors and they were white guys that sat behind computers. And, and I think about engineering as, as building technology that makes the world a better place and makes uh, humanity better. Uh, and, and I think those are stories that resonate with women and diverse people in general, when you look at why people go into engineering, especially diverse people. Um, but the thing that I worry about is that even if we could inspire all of these young women and minorities to study engineering, they would come into college and have a bad experience because we see the kinds of experiences that um, diverse undergrads have, that diverse graduate students have, that diverse faculty have. Uh, and also, you know, the undergrads that come in and then they go into industry and industry is also not a great place for diverse uh, engineers. So um, I feel like my focus anyway is more on the things that I have more of an ability to change, which is not the K through 12 and, and younger people, but you know, how do I make this school of engineering a place where diverse people can thrive at every level, undergrads, grads, postdocs, faculty? And if we can do that um, and then also influence companies, and that's what I'm doing through my professional society, you know, make companies a place where diverse people can thrive, then you have more role models. You have more people at every level that can uh, pay it forward by inspiring and mentoring and supporting the next generation behind them. And so I think we need to do both. We need to inspire more people in the next generation, but we also have to make sure that the environment we're creating for them to come in is, is one where they will thrive. I'd say be true to yourself, know who you are, um, define your comfort zone and then take two steps outside your comfort zone. Um, that's what I tell prospective students uh, when, they, when they come and see me. Cause I think, you know, if, if you take 10 steps beyond your comfort zone, um, it becomes a huge learning task and, and you get bogged down. Um, but taking two steps outside your comfort zone allows you to learn quickly and make progress quickly. I mean, I think in this uh, day and age, um, the most interesting problems happen at the boundary of disciplines. Um, and so being open to having partnerships and collaborations um, outside your, your domain of expertise and um, outside your domain of outside your comfort zone is, is important. So, so leaning in and, and being willing to take some chance in, in, in the unknown, I suppose. Every organization where you might work has some expectation of service, whether it's to the company or to the university. And certainly as academics, we're on all sorts of, you know, service roles. I would think the, the good thing there is to find some service thing you're, you're passionate about, because that way you can actually make the service work you do be in service to something that you actually care about, not just something you're actually expected to do, but something you're actually excited to be pointed at. Uh, for me, it's, you know, women in STEM and, and LGBT issues on campus. And so I, people, for the most part, ask me to do things I actually care to be spending my time on. Um, and the, the second um, is, it, and being true to yourself, like Lynn said, I think one piece of that is being passionate about your work and yet able to be dispassionate in, in your judgment of yourself. It's very easy for all of us. I think, you know, we, we have to do do less well at many things because we're trying to do too many things. And it can be very easy to be overly self-critical. So you need to somehow be able to direct criticism at yourself and yet not have it kill your confidence. It's not easy. I think it's something I struggle with. I'm sure most people do. But to the extent you can do that, you can you can grow immensely in the kind of work we do. It's so customized to our own interests that we can really grow quite quickly if we're able to, to have that right balance of passion and, and distance. The engineering profession needs diverse people. Uh, we are not doing a favor to the women and minorities and, and LGBTQ and all of the people that bring diverse perspectives into engineering. They are doing us a favor to make the profession thrive. And so as many challenges as diverse people face in, in becoming engineers and thriving in the profession, uh, I just want to convey that uh, you bring more to the profession uh, than you know. And so I hope you will persevere and, and not let uh, the challenges that you face, which we hope to overcome, but we haven't done it yet, uh, the challenges that diverse people face, I hope you will overcome those and, and realize how important it is for the profession and for the technologies and engineering that we do um, to reach its full potential to have people like you, to have diverse people uh, contributing. Mm -hmm.